So hi everyone and welcome to today's webinar titled Disaster Preparedness and Mitigation Led to Re Resiliency Considerations that Improve Outcomes. Please note this session is being recorded. The recording will be available within one to two business days on our website at ce.uci.edu. Please visit our free events page and click on the On Demand tab to view the recording. If you registered for our event through the free events website, you will automatically receive an email recording link. So keep an eye out for that. Hi everyone, my name is Katie Heck and I'm the program coordinator for the Emergency Management and Disaster Recovery Specialized Study Certificate Program here at UCI Continuing Education. First, I'll start off with a quick overview of Zoom features so you'll know how to submit questions throughout the presentation. Next, I'll be giving you some information of our fully online emergency management and disaster recovery certificate program. I'll cover the requirements, fees, and registration details regarding upcoming courses for our fall quarter, which begins this coming Monday, September 27th. I will then turn it over to our guest presenter, Jason Dempsey. At the end of our presentation, we'll have a brief Q&A session. And finally, I'll leave you with my contact information so you can send over any additional questions we may have not addressed in today's session. If you look at the top or bottom of your screen, you should see a row of icons. Click on the chat bubble icon and the panel will show up. If you encounter any technical difficulties during the webinar, please, see a, please send a chat message over to John at UCI support and he will help troubleshoot any issues. If you have a question for myself or Jason regarding the content of the presentation, please submit it in the chat and we will address it as soon as we see it or at the end of if we have time. Be sure to send your questions to all panelists and attendees. That way we will ensure that everyone can see each other's submissions. So to warm up the chat panel and get everyone comfortable with this feature, please share in the chat where you're tuning in from today um, and your job, title, or industry. Woodland Hills, that's awesome. Thanks so much. Entertainment industry, that's so fun. Emergency management specialist at, oh, I said it, Stanton State University office. Okay, awesome. Well, thanks everyone again. Um, feel free to continue to use the chat feature. Here's a brief overview of our emergency management and disaster recovery specialized study certificate program. Our program provides the knowledge and skills needed to identify risk and threat assessments, prepare emergency plans, manage response, and develop and implement recovery plans. Taught by industry experts, the program will help you become proficient in all aspects of emergency response and understand the relationships between local, state, and federal agencies during a disaster. As a student in the program, you will also receive individualized feedback from instructors and have the opportunity to learn and network with others in the field. Aging infrastructures, climate change, population growth, scarce natural resources, terrorist and active shooter scenarios, and sophisticated cybercrime all contribute to the rapidly expanding need for individuals who are skilled in preventing, responding, mitigating, and recovering from a wide variety of threats. The certificate program is composed of five courses. To be eligible for this certification, students must complete a minimum of nine units, which is about three courses with a letter grade of C or better. To receive their certificate after completing all program requirements, students must submit a request for a certificate. All requirements must be completed within five years. Here's a list of our courses. We have three units which run for 10 weeks or 1.5 units that will run for five weeks. We recommend students plan accordingly and enroll into courses as they are interested, as in some are only offered once a year. You can find courses, you can find course dates, textbook information, and enroll into any available courses by clicking on the green online button. The to be scheduled indicates when courses are projected to be offered. 
upcoming fall 2021 quarter, we are offering two courses fully online, our disaster response and recovery management and disaster mitigation. Each course is listed with its start and end dates as well as online course fee. Enrollment is currently open and students may enroll either online or over the phone by calling our student services department. And we're so excited. Our disaster mitigation course is taught by our guest speaker today, Jason Dempsey as well. The cost of the program, you pay for each course individually as you enroll as, a, as opposed to an entire tuition sum at once. There's also a $35 request for certificate fee for the program. The average cost also includes the textbook fees, course fees, and the request for certificate. Many of the courses do not require textbooks, and if they do, students can purchase or rent them from their vendor of choice. Please know that this is an average total and the cost per program depends on which courses you choose. At this time, it's my pleasure and honor to introduce our guest presenter today, Jason Dempsey. After eight tours of duty in the Middle East and Asia, an additional service with the Department of State in Latin America and Asia, Jason Dempsey retired from the Marine Corps in 2015 before joining the city of Los Angeles as an emergency manager. Currently, he's the emergency services administrator for the city of Costa Mesa, which is adjacent to Newport Beach, Huntington Beach, Irvine, Santa Ana, and John Wayne Airport in Orange County, California. He has a master's degree in Homeland Security from Pennsylvania State University and a master's degree in public administration from the University of Southern California. He's a certified emergency manager, CEM, and a certified business continuity professional, CBCP. We are very excited and honored to have him logged in today, and I'll hand it over to Jason. He can further introduce himself and begin his portion of the presentation. Well, hi, Katie. Thank you very much. So today I'm here to talk about disaster preparedness and mitigation and how they can lead to resiliency and some things we need to think about as we work to build our resiliency. So this is really important. Uh, Katie talked about it at the beginning when she introduced the program for UCI and that there's a historic number of disasters that are happening right now. Um, many of them climate associated, but there's all types of disasters. Uh, and the reason why it's it's particularly impactful to our society is, and when we take into consideration that even though, you know, weather change and, and climate change, some of those things are cyclical over the course of, of the, you know, the last hundred, the last 500 years, the last thousand years, the population of the world alone has tripled uh, in about the last 100, 150 years. And more and more people are living in areas that are increasingly densely populated. These densely populated areas are often in locations where those disasters, uh, those disasters hit. So whether you're living on the East Coast in Florida or along the Eastern seaboard, whether you're on the West Coast and you're in California and you're vulnerable to earthquakes and wildfires or you're in Oregon, whether you're in Asia, no matter where you're at, um, more and more people are living in those places that are impacted by these disasters and therefore they're they're, uh, they're struggling economically and, and oftentimes there's, there's loss of life. So there are some things that we can do as we look at natural disasters and, and other types of events that take place and how we can be better prepared. Uh, the fundamentals are pretty straightforward. Whether you're doing this for your household, whether you represent a business, a government organization, nonprofit, or any other entity. Uh, but one of the things that's also a challenge is kind of the stigma that's associated with preparedness. And it's, it's really strange if you think about it in our society where you have an event that you know is gonna happen. You know that eventually there's gonna be an earthquake if you're here on the West Coast. There's eventually gonna be a hurricane if you live on the East Coast, uh, especially in the Florida or Gulf Coast region. You know that there's gonna be wildfires if you live in the Pacific Northwest. You know that there's gonna be drought if you live in the desert. And yet oftentimes we ostracize or, or uh, as a society or we stigmatize those people or organizations that prepare, yet you don't know that you're gonna get in a car accident today. And when you get in your automobile and you go to the store, you're gonna put on your seatbelt or you're gonna have insurance for your, for your car or you're gonna have medical insurance. So it's kind of, it's one of those things that we need to 
to get it over as society and get our arms around and just destigmatize. What we also need to do is sort of understand the landscape that we're dealing with. And the landscape is, is really complex. It is not only where we're at, but it's all those interconnected um, intricacies that allow our society to work and how they're vulnerable to different hazards. And so I'm gonna give you some examples as we go forward and how those examples are relevant to you and your particular situation, whether you're looking at improving your preparedness or your resiliency for yourself and your household or the organization you represent. Like in my case, where I work for the city of Costa Mesa. Um, you know, there's the hazards that we need to be vulnerable or that, that we need to be aware of. Um, and as we prepare to address those hazards, also the different capabilities and limitations that we can bring to bear to improve our preparedness. So a city is gonna have more resources than, than a house. Um, and then as we implement our different preparedness measures, what sort of mutual aid or mutual assistance measures are in place that, that we can implement? So it starts with your next door neighbor, the person across the street, the person down the street, uh, the people, maybe if you have kids that you, you take your kids to different sporting, sporting events, that type of thing. If you're a city, you're looking at mutual aid with the cities adjacent to you before you start looking around the county. If you're a business, maybe the businesses on your street or that are a part of the same um, business association as you. But these are all different factors that we need to consider as we work to understand the landscape that we're in and what sort of capabilities and limitations we have as we look at the problem. So to kind of give you an example of how this ties together and what are the sort of secondary and tertiary effects related to everything that we need to consider, um, I'm gonna talk about energy for a little bit, specifically electricity. So if you're looking at the slide, one of the things that you'll notice is the Cyber Security Infrastructure and Security Agency uh, from the Department of Homeland Security about a week and a half ago came out with a document and in it, they pointed out something that's, that's kind of obvious to a lot of people, but maybe not obvious to a lot of others. And that is that all energy, including electricity that we use every day is impacted by, by drought. It's impacted by water. And the reason for that is every type of electricity that you and I use for the most part today on a large scale needs water to make it work. So whether you live in an area where there's nuclear power, there's coal-fired power plants, there's natural gas. Um, if you live in some parts, of the uh, some parts of the world, they actually have oil burning power plants like in the Middle East. There's lots of stuff out there, but the bulk of our power comes from those types of fossil fuels just because of the cost associated. And even when we talk about solar and um, some types of uh, other power out there, they use water. All of them use water because they're basically using the energy that they get from that, uh, from that source to heat up water. And that water is used to turn a turbine, which then generates the electricity that each one of us uses. And all of that energy and all of that electricity is necessary for us to live the life that we live. When you go out today, when you woke up this morning and at some point maybe you turned on a faucet or you flipped on the lights, or you opened up a refrigerator to get something out of it. That, the power that, there was electricity that was used obviously to cool down that refrigerator and turn on those lights. But the same electricity was also used to pump the water to your faucet. The water district in the area where you live uses electricity. Or if you live on a well somewhere and you have a well in your house because you live on a big piece of property, you're still using electricity to go ahead and run the pump that's bringing the water to your faucet. So why is this such a big deal? Well, there's a lot of drought going on right now. Um, there's a study that was published in the Journal of Science last year that found that between the year 2000 and the year 2018, it was the driest 19 year stretch since the 1500s. So that's a long time. We're talking like 500 years. This last 20 years has been the dry stretch in the last 500 years. And that's around the world. So this is everywhere. And what I'm going to talk to you about is, is this drought closer to home? Uh, you know, UCI is here in California in Orange County. 
And this is what it looks like as of September 21, when we look at the, the US drought monitor. Over 86% of this state, of the counties in the state, are under an emergency proclamation. The governor, the governor's actually come out and said that it's so bad that it's a declared emergency, just like COVID, just like an earthquake, just like a hurricane, just like a terrorist attack. Um, and the idea is so that he can bring to bear other resources that hopefully will help some of these places. If you're tracking how the state of California gets their water, a lot of that water, not all of it, but a portion of it comes from out of state from the Colorado River. And there's a bunch of steps that are being taken to impact how that water is being distributed throughout the desert Southwest. Um, you know, and some of it's a little controversial, but the bottom line is, is that the drought that's out there is impacting everyone. In the state of Arizona, approximately, they're in a top, they're a top 2% um, agricultural state for certain crops, certain crops that are used to feed animals, for instance. So as the drought impacts Arizona and they're getting a much smaller percentage of water from the Colorado River and other sources, then the, the cost of raising those crops is gonna go up and the amount of crops they can, they can uh, produce, it is also gonna go up, which is gonna not just impact those people in that agricultural area that are relying on those products or that are providing products to those different areas that are, that are growing those crops, but also the people that on the end buy those crops to feed their animals. So now the cost of livestock is gonna go up which means that, and some of those places aren't gonna be able to have as much livestock anymore, which means that the cost of food at the grocery store is gonna go up for you. So these are just examples of how everything's sort of interconnected. If we look at nearby locations, so not even just in the United States, which this by the way, is what the United States looks like right now um, in terms of the US drought monitor. In Canada, Canada is the world's biggest exporter of Durham wheat. So this is a type of wheat that's used in products like pasta. So if you guys like pasta, um, your pasta cost is about to go up because they're the biggest world, they're the world's biggest exporter of this type of wheat. And right now they're about to have a decline of 50% in the amount that they produce because of the drought. So this is the amount they produce since the year 2016. If we look at since 2020, um, it's about half of, what they produced last year. But the bottom line is, is the cost is gonna go up and it's, it's due to the drought. And right now I'm just talking about crops and we're not talking about other things. So a lot of the products that we're looking at and the cost of living and everything, it's all tied to energy. And it's a big deal. It's something that we need to be prepared for and we need to continue to work at addressing. Like I said, we know that the Production of electricity is impacted by drought. We know it, and I kind of explained why. You need the water to cool down those systems. You need the water to move those systems that generate the electricity. Um, but further, without electricity, not only will we not be to where we're at today, but the amount of food that we make, we wouldn't be able to make without electricity. The factories that produce the the fertilizer and the other products that are used to grow the food, to raise the food, to harvest the food, that build those, that are used to help build those machines, that would no longer be possible without sustained electricity. And the drought is impacting that. And other things, certainly for sure. But electricity is, is tied to all of those things. Electricity is, you know, when I talk to, to my city here in, in Orange County, California, and I talk to them about what I'm most concerned about. It's, you know, I don't always break it down in the terms of the particular type of disaster. Is it an earthquake? Is it a wildfire? Is it something else? But I look at what are some of the effects that are coming out of it. And if it were sustained for a long period of time, electricity is one of my top two concerns. Electricity and water, actually, are the two top concerns that I have. Because with those, you can do, you can build the capability or uh, improvise the capability to do most other things, whether it's grow food or communicate or move things from point A to point B. Without those, you can't. Um, and keep in mind, the longer the electricity is out, it continues to impact these other things that are on the slide in front of you. So a lot of the places that we have that have backup power systems, such as generators, the, the cell phone towers, for example, 
it's usually less than three days of, of backup power, at least here in California. And I'll give you an example of why. It used to be approximately a week, but those generators use a lot of fuel, a lot of fossil fuels to, to run. And that fossil fuel is dirty and it has to be cycled out a lot and it creates pollution. So there are some envi environmental measures that were put forth in the state of California uh, not too long ago that penalize people that have those backup generators for those cell phone towers from having too much fuel on site. And so now what's happened is those people that own those sites have reduced the amount of fuel on site, which in turn has resulted in a, a reduced capacity for backup power at each one of those places. And that's just for those cell phone towers. There's also take a, a city. We have a fire and, and police dispatch inside the city of Costa Mesa. Some other cities in Orange County do as well. Um, the county does in Los Angeles County, very similar. Each one of those critical sites has some sort of backup power system, whether it's a generator, solar, or some sort of hybrid uh, version of both. If you're a hospital, you also have that. But each one of those is reliant on backup power. And if that power is out, then those generators are now using that fuel. And once that fuel is out, then those generators are no longer going to function. And gas stations that are in the area or fuel stations that are operating, if they don't have electricity, they actually can't pull the fuel out of the ground. So that complicates the problem if you want to, to restock fuel in different areas. If you have an agreement with some place to pour the fuel out of the ground, then you have to have some other mechanism in place to, to pull it out because there's no power. So what else do we know? Well, what we know is I just spoke about drought and electricity. And I, I went on and on about how we're vulnerable to drought and uh, why we need to consider a variety of different things with electricity. But that's just one one type of disaster, one type of natural disaster that's out there. And there's so many other ones that are out there. We just looked at Hurricane Ida that, that uh, impacted the Gulf Coast. The Dixie Fire, about to be the second largest wildfire in California history. Well, it already is. Um, it came pretty close to being the largest. And as they wrap it up, it's about 94% contained this morning is what they say. If you're living in Spain, we saw that volcano. Everyone just woke up to the volcano going off. And if you look at this, this flooding in Germany that took place in July, I mean, look at the picture. It's remarkable. What can take place? The natural, natural disasters that, that take place and just everything that we think is operating smoothly is then broken apart by Mother Nature. So there's so much that can, that can happen that we're vulnerable to that we need to prepare for. Um, and things that we need to try to build our, our resiliency to. And one of the ways that we do that is not only with uh, preparedness, different types of preparedness measures, but also looking at how we can mitigate. And when we mitigate, what we're trying to do is to reduce or eliminate the adverse impacts of whatever's taking place. So sometimes we can come close to eliminating it, although that's very difficult to do, but oftentimes we can, we can reduce the impact. So if there's a flood, maybe we build some type of uh, flood levees in the area as they've, they've done in New Orleans and it seems to have worked in this, this last hurricane that they had. Um, if, and if you're in an area where there's wildfires, they have what they call fire breaks, where they have huge areas, wide areas that they clear of all brush and all vegetation to make sure that, or make it more difficult for the fire to jump over from one vegetated area to another. Uh, if if you're in an area where there's earthquakes, there's earthquake retrofitting, which makes the, the building or the structure more resilient to the shifting and shaking that takes place during a, an earthquake. There's lots of different ways we can, we can mitigate. What we can also do is look at how we can further prepare our, our organization, our household, ourselves, our community, in terms of the things that we need to live until normalcy is restored. And this is actually the challenging part. This is actually the really challenging part, as simple as it sounds. It's challenging for a lot of reasons. It's challenging because first, there's a stigma that I had mentioned that's associated with this. 
this is something we know is going to happen. We know that a, a disaster is going to take place at some point. We know it. No matter where you live, something's going to take place. It might not be huge, but it might be. But we know there's going to be an event that takes place. Yet it's convenient to stigmatize. Um, and so it's a challenge to get that across to people um, that they don't, they don't need to be concerned about the stigma. They need to be prepared. There's also a cost associated with it. So if you're a, a person, if you're a business, if you're a city, if you're some other type of government or nonprofit entity, there's a cost associated with it in terms of researching what you need, how much of it, procuring it, storing it, maintaining it. There's a cost. Um, and everyone has limited resources in terms of each one of those things. You have limited people, limited money, limited storage space, limited time to go back and check what you have. Um, and then everything is evolving so fast, depending on what you're getting, it may not be something, you know, something that made sense to, to procure a year ago and may be less relevant today. So what we can do is, is look at addressing those things that are at the core of what makes our society vulnerable so that we can survive until there's a, a, two normal, a new normal or until um, normalcy is restored and we're past the actual problem. So some sort of sustainable water source. To give an example, uh, Los Angeles International Airport, if you ever uh, fly through that airport or travel in that airport, at times there's up to 50,000, between 50,000 and 100,000 people distributed throughout the terminals, 50 to 100,000 people. There's between five and 50,000 city and concessionaires, like employees of the different businesses on, on site. So there could be upwards of 150,000 people on a really, really busy day, like say during the holiday season at LAX. Now LAX is one of those locations where if, you're, if you've been there before and you actually try to walk off the airport, there's not really a whole lot of places you can go. There's a handful of hotels, but it's mostly businesses. And then you start getting into residential neighborhoods and so they have a policy there that if the airport were to be shut down due to an earthquake or due to an act of terrorism, say, or the airport shut down like it was after 9-11, that until they can get all the people off the airport, whether they're employees or people that are tra traveling through the airport, that they're kind of responsible for them. So they have a plan in place for how, as an airport, they would basically buy all the food in all the stores and all the restaurants and distribute it to anyone that's in the terminals and basically encourage them to leave and find another place to go if they can that's more sustainable for them. So get a hotel, go to your friend, go to your family. Um, they also have a, a way to get more drinking water. So there's whatever the drinking water is that's in the terminals, but they also have canned water there. So if, if anyone's ever had a can of soda, like a like a Coke can or a, a soda can, they have hundreds of thousands of those cans that they store at the airport that in the worst case emergencies, they'll actually distribute throughout the terminals. Well, why is that important? If, if any of you guys remember a few years ago, there was actually a power outage at the Atlanta airport and that power outage went out for, it was out for some time. And there were many people stuck inside the airport when the power was out. Um, and there were a lot of problems that were created, people uh, unhappy, people scared. Uh, it happened towards the end of the day. So there's, it was dark in many places in the airport, even with the little emergency power they had in some places, it was very dark. One of the other problems they ran into is when you go into some of these, these restrooms, maybe where, where you work or you've been to places where they have the motion sensors in front of the, the toilets, well, those are all powered by electricity as well, right? And so in the Atlanta airport, when the power went out, now none of these toilets flush. And there was not a manual way to, to activate that toilet. So as you can imagine, with tens of thousands of people inside the airport for hours and no toilets that flush, it quickly became a problem in addition to the, to the darkness and the other issues that were there. So taking all, of this type, all these types of things into account is really important for us as we try to prepare ourselves and our organization for, for what's next. Um, 
And oftentimes it's, it's just gonna be for, the things that happen the most are natural disasters. So we know that there's some, some things that are caused by humans, whether it's someone acting nefariously and it's an act of terrorism or crime, or if it's an accident, like an airplane crash, or a train derailment, or um, a, a big pipe, like a hazardous materials pipe bursting. So there's all types of things like that that happen. But consistently, we know that people are gonna need water, they're gonna need to, to eat, and there's gonna be areas that are more impacted by the lack of food and the lack of water in the aftermath of something, because some people just by nature of, of where they live or what they've got going on in their particular life, they have a reduced access to some of these resources. So it's something we need to consider. Um, and the same thing goes for power. Uh, the University of California, Irvine is, as you can imagine, most of the campuses is, is located in the city of Irvine. Um, a couple of years ago, Irvine actually had a power outage that was caused by John Wayne Airport. There's a transformer uh, next to John Wayne Airport in Orange County that had sustained some damage and the power went out. Um, luckily, it went out mostly over the weekend and most of the places that were, that were impacted were uh, commercial and, and light industrial area. The problem is, is that there's a lot of people in the community that, that were impacted. And some of those people um, that did not have power are on different types of machines or apparatus that they need to basically keep them alive. So maybe they're on some sort of uh, O2, like oxygen apparatus that's getting, that needs power, um, different other types of things. They're receiving home care. There's, uh, there's facilities that actually, they're kind of like nursing homes, but they're called uh, skilled nursing facilities that people are in. Some of these locations lost power. So, Considering all these different vulnerabilities in the community or the area that we're in is something that we need to do to build our resilience. And then as we look at building our resilience, um, it's important that repeatedly we keep in mind that the, the resilience, there's, there's a cost associated with each step, whether it's preparation or mitigation. And the cost associated is basically people, time, and money. And that goes both for preparation and for mitigation. And the more we do in advance with mitigation, with preparation, the less that cost will be on the back end after the, the emergency or the disaster has taken place. So taking the time, taking, making the sacrifice and investing upfront in terms of what people we need to allocate and their time that we need to allocate, um, there's gonna be sort of a, a political cost potentially, depending on if, if we're talking about an organization, um, and then the money that you have to invest, it's really important. And we can also keep some of those costs down by just focusing on those essentials that I you know, showed in the very one of the first slides where we talked about just the essentials. Again, the essentials are what's most important. And so when we know that we have limited resources, we know that we, have, we don't have that much time and we don't have a ton of money to spend, it's important that we do so thoughtfully and uh, it's, it's well thought out how we're gonna go ahead and invest those, those resources. So when we look at mitigation and, and uh, preparation that we do so in a way that makes sense. So resilience. What resilience really comes down to in the end is, is us being able to stand in the face of any type of disaster or other significant change in condition and just weather the storm to weather the storm and to recover from it, uh, to make our way through to the other side. And it's not always easy. The, the things that I'm talking about, the steps that we can take, they're not, it's not saying we're gonna come through as a society, as a neighborhood, as an organization unscathed. It's just saying that we'll come through with the best possible outcome if we do so in a way that makes sense. So we wanna take the time to go ahead and invest our time you know, our, our people and our resources, our, our money, which in turn are our resources to build our preparation and to build our resilience. Um, because we got a plan. All the different things that, that we looked at, um, in the end, it's gonna come down to how we, can, how we can prepare ourselves and how we can prepare our communities. And right now, one of those key things that I'm looking at is all the things that are, that are changing around our world with the climate. 
Uh, the drought is one of the most in front, most uh, one of the biggest threats at the forefront that we need to look at is th are things associated with climate change. Regardless of why you think that that climate is changing, the fact is there's a drought. There's a lot of wildfires. The number of wildfires we're having, um, they're not quite at historic highs, but they're pretty close. And the basically one of the other things to think about that I didn't touch on, but it was inside our uh, the little word slide that was out there is famine. When we look at the drought, when we look at the reduced power that we're producing from these different hydroelectric dams around the country, we have reduced food output. Why is that important? The United States is one of the biggest exporters of food to the world, period. Most of us probably heard something about it when we were growing up that the US produces somewhere between half and two thirds of, of the world's grains that are exported. Well, it's a big deal if we're producing 50% or 60% of what we typically produce, or in some cases, maybe it's 70%, but there's a huge reduction. And what that means is maybe the food isn't, isn't gonna be gone for you tomorrow. It's just gonna cost a lot more. The problem is there's a great potential in the next year or so that there's gonna be famine across the world in part because of factors like this drought. Other factors for sure, but the drought's gonna be one of those, those uh, contributing factors that are making the famine possible. So it's important that all of us look at what we can do to be more resilient for ourselves, for our households, for the organization that we're in, and we build our resilience through preparation and through mitigation. So that's all I have. Does anyone have any questions? I know it's kind of a lot, kind of a, a short presentation, but it, this is, it's really important. And to be honest, the, the, the breadth of what we could cover in this topic could take many hours if we had the time. Thank you so much, Jason, for all of that informative information. Um, we really appreciate it. And like you said, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to use the chat um, and respond to all ho to hosts and panelists and we can um, have a live discussion. Thank you, Misty. We appreciate you being here with us. One question that I had, Jason, was, um, what are some simple things that like an everyday person can do to help, you know, be intentional and mindful and, and plan um, maybe like just within their own household? Yeah, sure, Katie. That's a great question. Uh, there's, there's actually a lot of simple things that you can do. Um, let's take food, for example. I, I mentioned food, water, and uh, electricity. So if you think about food. Right now, all of us have, I would presume, some food in your house. So whatever you eat right, right now, just have a little bit more of it in the house. If you, I don't know, it's, it's going to be more difficult with fresh foods. So if you eat a lot of fruits and vegetables and, uh, and natural foods, it's going to be a little bit more challenging, but just have a little bit more of it in the house. If you are eating a lot of natural foods and it's more challenging, then look at having a garden. And really everyone should maybe look at having some sort of natural food source like a garden or uh, fruit, something growing in their house. As far as water goes, I think uh, water is a really big concern. I see Dave in the chat mentioning it. I know one of the things that I do for water is, or one of my concerns is even the potability of water. So one of the things I did not mention in the, in the, uh, the presentation is that Southern California was almost on a boil water notice a few months ago, and a little bit made it in the news if you go ahead and do a Google search on, on the chlorine shortage that was taking place. But it actually hit the water districts throughout Southern California. And had, it, had they not found a, a solution that was improvised, um, the water that, came on, that comes out of your faucet may not have been potable. And in many areas, they, you would have had to boil your water. Or you find some way to filter it. So one of the things that I do is I have a, a countertop water filter, does not use electricity, 
And every day in my house, um, everyone fills up their refillable water bottles with this gravity fed water filter. And it costs a couple hundred bucks, but it lasts for years and years and you just take care of it. And, and it's, you know, then you always have potable water um, and maybe store some extra water at your house. As far as power goes, if you don't have any special, special needs or special concerns that use power, you're, you're obviously in a little bit better of a place, I guess, but, um, you know, using rechargeable batteries and just thing, things like that, that are, it's not even just an environmental thing. It's just meaning that you, you have something at your disposal that if the power would go out, you have a way to, to recharge those batteries, or maybe you can get with someone else that has the ability to do it. Um, I'm seeing in the chat something about emergency baby food. You know, I haven't I haven't given a ton of thought to that. I have I have two kids myself. Both of them are small. My youngest is is four years old, and um, you know, my my kids were both fed mostly naturally, but uh, I did have some some uh, baby food. I want to say in the house, but for the most part, I think at a very young age, I started feeding them adult food. My doctor said I could. Uh, feed them adult food and we just found a way to smash it up and just make it more easy for the the small child to to consume that food so there wasn't anything they could choke on um but there's a lot of things you can do and it doesn't have to cost a lot of money i think that's one of the other things other than the stigma that a lot of people are concerned about that there's a there's a high cost and it doesn't have to be if you live if you work in an office building man or woman and you wear those fancy shoes that that everyone wears because uh, you're, I don't know, that's how you have to dress there, then maybe in your desk or in your car or somewhere else, you just have an old pair of tennis shoes that are not, they're not the, the latest 2021 style, but there's some other functional tennis shoes that if there's an earthquake, you can throw those on. Uh, there's little things like that you can do. So you're, you're not going out of your way to spend more money, but you're just being more thoughtful about using the resources that you already have at your disposal. And I mean, and then there's other positive impacts by doing that anyway. That's awesome. Thank you for those great tips and um, appreciate you sharing some, you know, cost effective, you know, ways to be resourceful in what you already have to help reduce, you know, I you know there's a lot of waste in the fashion um, industry as well. And, you know, fast fashion, I feel is something that I've been following recently, um, especially with online shopping and all that kind of fun stuff, but that does have a repercussion when it comes to being sustainable and um, being resourceful. Well, one of the other things, Katie, I want to mention as well is uh, everyone needs to realize whether you're, you're listening to this webinar live or you're looking at it later or you're just kind of flipping through it and scanning through it. If a big disaster happens, who do you think is going to come to your help? Honestly, right now where you sit, who do you really think is going to come to your help? When you think about there's a fire department out there, they have some paramedics in the fire department here in California, that there's a police department and, you know, UCI has their own. But how many, how many of those people do you think are going to come to you personally and help you out if the whole area has been hit by an earthquake and the power's out and everything is chaos and confusion, even if you personally aren't hurt? But I mean, who do you, who do you think is going to come? In the early hours, there's a very high probability that no one is, unless it's someone else you work with or just someone else passing by. But it's not gonna be some person that that's what they do for a living. Um, on, on a regular day, I'll take the city of Irvine right now where UCI is at. I mean, I, I don't know how many police officers or firefighters everyone think are, thinks are out on the streets at a given time, but there's not as many as you would think. That's probably the nicest way for me to put it. It, it wouldn't be cost effective. It's not like there's thousands of police officers and firefighters walking the streets of Irvine. There's not that many. Um, the Irvine Police Department's only a couple hundred people. And those couple hundred people are there 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So there's obviously shifts. So that's why it's so important, knowing that there's not a lot of people out there that can come to you, no matter what community you're in, and help you immediately after something happens. It's incumbent upon you if you not, you're not just taking care of yourself, but you're taking care of other people in your household, family, friends, your neighbor, 
um, your pet, your dog, your cat, your parakeet, whatever you got, that you think about this ahead of time and you take thoughtful steps to make sure that until help arrives that you have something in place. That's so important. And thank you, Jason, again. Um, if you all are interested and wanna learn more about this topic, please enroll into his disaster mitigation course starting on October 11th. Um, it's a five week course fully online and Jason has a lot of great content and even more helpful tips that can help prepare you and just you can be more knowledgeable and aware for yourself, your family, friends, and your community. So at this time, um, we can still take a few more questions if you have any more questions or um, any topics you want to share. Um, please, again, the chat is open. And if you all are thinking about a chat, uh, a question to add to the chat, I will just ask Jason if you want to leave us with any um, thoughts or any last minute wisdom nuggets. Um, I'll open the floor to you right now. No, I mean, I I went through it pretty quick, and um, and. I, I guess what I want to emphasize is that your, our vulnerability as a society to drought, to famine, and uh, man, let me rephrase that, not to famine here in the U.S. necessarily, but definitely food shortages, the type of food you're looking for, the amount of it you're looking for, at the price point you're looking for, all of that is going to be dramatically impacted in this, this next year. Uh, so if you think that prices have gone up already with food, with water, with some of the other things that, that you use, it's going to go up more and significantly, significantly more because all of these things are interconnected and there's a lot on the horizon. So I mentioned uh, a couple of times, one of the reports that I was looking at, some of the groups that I'm tied into with the Department of Homeland Security and um, some other federal agencies that Behind closed doors, this is something that's talked about a lot, and they're actually tied into the different industries, the utility industry, specifically with electricity, other groups specifically with, with water, um, the agricultural industry. There's actually groups of businesses and companies that privately talk with the government about this is what we've got going on. And um, it's, I mean, the costs are gonna go up and access is gonna be reduced uh, a bit for the foreseeable future. And the trend that we've been seeing with water, power, and food prices is going to continue for a while. To be honest, uh, there's been talk, some of it, including some uh, medications, and it has to do with different chemicals that come out of different countries in the world and places where they're manufactured, such as India and China, are also being directly impacted uh, by the different things we've talked about, as well as other logistical challenges. So... You know, when you think about what you need to do be, to be prepared, if you wear eyeglasses, having an extra set of eyeglasses, or if you wear contacts, ensure you have an up-to-date set of eyeglasses. If you take any sort of medication or you know anyone that does, talk to your doctor about maybe if it's wise having a little bit extra of that on hand uh, to make it through if, if there is an interruption in your access to some of those different things. Um, this is really an important time, and I would hope that in light of what's taken place over the last year and a half with COVID-19, that people won't feel too stigmatized as they consider their own vulnerability to some of these things and what they might need to, to do to be better prepared. Even if you buy stuff on Amazon, if you've looked, there's less and less stuff on Amazon, less and less stuff. I mean, certain things there's plenty of. If you need to go buy socks on Amazon or some other online shopping, shopping store that's there, but specific things that you're using, um, you're gonna see uh, reduced access to those things just because of logistics. It used to cost $2,000 approximately to getting a 20 foot shipping container from China to the port of Los Angeles, the port of Long Beach. Now it's over $20,000. And that just took place in the last year and a half, but that's a 10 times increase in the cost of shipping. 
So that's going to include chemicals that are used to make some of the products that we use here, fertilizers and other stuff. So just take that into consideration. Everything is so complicated, but it's all, there's just a worldwide uh, problem right now. And so to weather the storm, all of us need to do what we can to be a little bit better prepared and just aware of what's out there. Thank you, Jason. And then at this time, I'll go ahead and share my screen. Um, So this webinar that we had with Jason today is a part of a webinar series in our emergency management program. And so up next, we have Bounce Back to What? Disaster Recovery Insights from Houston, Texas and U.S. Virgin Islands on a Friday, October 15th. You can also check out our previous webinar, Disaster Response and Decision Support. Um, it's located on our free events on demand webpage. So stay tuned and stay up to date. Again, if you have any questions for myself about this program, Jason's upcoming course, or anything in general that was presented at the topic, presented on this topic today, please don't hesitate to reach out to me if you have any ideas or um, for future webinars that you'd like to see us present on, please also share those with me as well. Um, thank you so much again, Jason, for all of your wisdom for spending time with us today and sharing your expertise. We really appreciate it. I hope you all stay safe and have a great day. Thank you.